Hi, I'm Curtis Harmon. I'm the coordinator of the partnership program for the Schizophrenia Society of Saskatchewan. I've coordinated the partnership program for nearly 20 years and I've been with the Schizophrenia Society since 1999. And the partnership program is essentially a stigma busting program and our goals are to reduce the stigma and misconceptions with schizophrenia and related mental illnesses such as bipolar disorder, anxiety and depression and to promote treatment and recovery in the community and make people aware of the services that are available. So the partnership program has existed since the early 1990s and it was developed in Vancouver, British Columbia and then it spread across Canada in the 1990s and Saskatchewan developed a team in 1998. So we've been very active and we've given over 4,000 presentations in Saskatchewan to nearly 200,000 people over the past 21 years. So we've been very busy, very diligent. We have a wonderful group of volunteers, people living with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, anxiety and depression, family members of people with mental illness, and healthcare professionals of all kinds, and healthcare advocates such as social workers, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, addictions counselors, and even students work training in those fields. So we go out to all the high schools in Saskatoon and across Saskatchewan really, and elementary schools, colleges and universities, drug and alcohol detox centers, churches, community groups, we reach First Nations audiences, and we share stories of recovery. And that really puts a human face um, to mental health and it lets people see a first-hand perspective on recovery and that it is possible for people with treatment, with medication, with sobriety from drugs and alcohol, with counseling and positive lifestyle changes, people can have a better quality of life and um, get their lives back. My name is Heidi Fisher. I've been with the program for about uh, two years or so and I present from the perspective of, of a person with major depressive disorder as well as anxiety. Some of the symptoms that I noticed um, right off the start was probably in my early teenage years. Um, I just noticed kind of like I was sad and unhappy, um, not really wanting to connect with people, some of that sort of stuff. Um, and Originally, it was a little bit hard to understand because you're a teenager and you haven't heard of this and you think, oh, maybe this is how teenagers feel. So it kind of took a long time for me to figure out really what was going on. Um, so those symptoms kind of stayed and went over my teen years into my 20s and then kind of more into my 20s, they got even more difficult um, to the point of like thinking about ending my life and that sort of thing. So it got to be pretty extreme in the later years. So what does depression feel like? Um, I always have this little bit of a joke. So if people are familiar with Lord of the Rings and Frodo climbing Mount Doom, that's what depression feels like. So it, so it sounds silly, but if you're, if you're a fan of that movie or you know those books, then you kind of know what that is. Like every step is arduous. Everything takes so much energy and you're so tired. And that kind of just takes up all your thinking because really you're just thinking like, how am I going to get out of bed? How am I going to make lunch? So that to me is kind of how it, how it manifests, just a lot of tiredness. And then that tiredness kind of leads down to, um, you know, thinking badly about myself of like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do these things? Um, I also experience anxiety, like I had mentioned. And so for me, I think that is kind of classic anxiety, like the feelings in the body of just heart beating, sweating, um, can't think properly or kind of racing thoughts and it doesn't calm down over, you know, two or three minutes, it kind of lasts for a while. So what triggers the symptoms for me? Um, it varies from time to time. I think some of it can be some of those basic things like, am I eating right? Am I sleeping enough? Um, some of those things that for other people, if they maybe miss a couple meals or they don't sleep for a couple nights, for other people, maybe that's not that big of a deal. But for me, if I, if I find that that's happening, then it can cause um, the depression or the anxiety to kind of pop out. 
Um, I think sometimes the trigger is maybe just sort of more medical than outside. So it's just kind of like it just kind of happens. But we kind of know that it's that when I go in to see my doctor and we, we change a prescription and, and oh, and now I feel better. So it kind of seems like it's just a medical issue. As early as my, my early teens, so about 14 or so, somewhere in there, I kind of knew something was wrong. And even at that time, I would have liked to have gotten help. I have a pretty distinct memory. I grew up on a farm and nobody was around. They were probably out in the field or something. And I snuck into the kitchen and I pulled out the phone book and I looked through it to be like, how do you see a therapist? Like, how, what do I do? Something's wrong. I don't know what to do. But no, I had never talked to anybody about this. I went to a K to 12 school. There was no such thing as a counselor. So I had never heard anything about all this. So at that time, I didn't get help. I just kind of did things on my own. So it wasn't really until my 20s. I was in college at the time, and I had a professor. And she was really open about her struggles with mental illness. And that kind of opened my eyes of like, OK, this is safe to talk to people about. And there are options. And maybe she, this teacher could help me figure it out. So that's what I ended up doing, was talking with this teacher. And after that, it was a lot easier. You know, like, of course, the first appointment, going in to see the doctor and that sort of thing, you're nervous. But really, the challenge for me was that those growing up years and not knowing what to do. My life changed for the better when I got help. I think before it always felt like this sort of secret. It felt like, oh, I'm not supposed to talk about this or there's something wrong with me. You know, it, there's just that stigma behind it. And I think you really take that on as a person and feel as though you're a bad person or there's something wrong with you. And so once I started getting help and I, I saw a therapist, I was taking medication, and just realizing, oh, like m other people experience this. It's not just me. Oh, there are options and people do get better. So that's really where I saw the improvements. Medications for me are my pretty much my number one thing um, that keep me well. I've kind of, like a lot of people who have tried treatment, have tried, I've tried a lot of things. So I've done just therapy. I've done just medication. I've done this or that. Um, and a lot of things are helpful, but for me, the medication is, seems to be the number one thing that keeps me going. The main thing I notice, and people will want, sometimes ask, like, well, how do you know it's working, or how do you know you need it? And so for me, without it, I often have suicidal thoughts to the point where it's kind of almost like a constant thing going on in my head. And once I'm on a medication that works, I don't have those thoughts anymore. So it's not a happy pill. It doesn't change who I am. It, it just makes it so my thinking can be clear and I'm not having those thoughts that I don't want to have. Um, and then, yeah, the second part to me that's really important is therapy. Um, and that kind of changes um, with the seasons and what I'm going through. So sometimes I might go once a month. Sometimes I might go every other week. So that kind of can change and goes up and down. As far as um, sobriety and that sort of thing, I've never been a person to really go down that road of much drinking or, or any sort of drugs or alcohol. So I've always just kind of kept that in my mind of like, well, I never really have gone down that road, so why, why go down it at this point? And I know that substances can affect my medication or they could make a, a symptom come out that I haven't had before, you know, or something like that. So to me, it just feels better just not to go down that road. If I could warn people about something regarding uh, mental illness or addictions, I think one of the biggest things would be to, for people to realize they're not alone. Um, so often that's the thing I hear of if I tell my story or I'm doing different things and people will often say, oh, I thought I was the only one. I didn't think anybody else had that symptom. And I think we really, what we're doing with the partnership program is really showing like, no, you're not the only one. Um, you know, you don't have to think like that and you don't have to feel so alone. It's really important for me to have family and friends that are supportive 
Um, I think like all humans, we're created for connections, right? Like, so we need, the, no matter who you are in life, you need to be having connections. But with mental illness, I find often with the darker thoughts that can come with mental illness, there'll be things like, you know, I'm no good, or nobody likes me, or I don't belong anywhere, I can't, I'm not contributing to society, you know, those sorts of thoughts. And when you're sitting at home alone in the dark or whatever you do, those th it's easy for those thoughts to kind of continue and ruminate and ruminate. But if you have friends or family that you go out and see, or you know, so you go for coffee or you have a call or you do whatever, as soon as you have another human that you're interacting with, pretty quickly they'll say like, no, that's ridiculous, or like, I really love you, or you know, these are all the things that you do that are important and that you accomplish. So those, I think, are part of the reason why it's so important to have good connections with uh, family or friends. And then too, sometimes just to have that person that kind of keeps an eye on you of like, oh, hey, like I noticed you've been late for work every day this week, or I've noticed you haven't been coming out to soccer practice or, you know, whatever it is that you do, just to have that extra eye and even to have a conversation with them of like, hey, if I'm doing this or if things seem to be not going well, would it be possible for you in the future to ask me how I'm doing and maybe offer to take me to an appointment or whatever? So there's like, there's all sorts of ways it's, I, that I think it's really important. What else has been really important um, as far as helping me with my mental health? A couple of years ago, I had been at the Dubai at the psychiatric center for a couple of weeks um, because my mental health had gotten really bad. And when I got out, I just on a whim decided to start a mental health Instagram. I didn't really know what I was doing or even really why I was doing it, but I just thought, oh, this will be a neat thing. and it'll give me a chance to, to express myself. Well, it kind of grew from that into this whole big thing. And so like we were talking before with community, I kind of have this really interesting online community now that I connect with. And we and it hasn't just stayed on Instagram. So we've done things in real life. Um, the last three Christmases, I've done a gift drive where we've collected gifts for the Dubai. Um, I've done projects where followers send me their pictures and we post it with the illness that they have or I have ones where I ask them questions or I ask them to send me a picture of their medication and we post that and I do themes so I'm, I'm pretty busy on there and through doing that I kind of opened up a lot of doors so it's actually through doing that is how I, I heard about the Schizophrenia Society and so I kind of went into doing presentations with, with this group and kind of open the doors for some other things. Um, so that's been really, really important to me and it kind of gives me something to focus on. I, every day when I wake up, I think, oh, what am I gonna post about? And people send me messages and I've made friends with some people um, off of there and now I'm friends with them in the, in the community. So that's really been nice. Um, it's mental health YXE and you're welcome to follow me if you like. Um, I also like to do art, poetry. I've always kind of done those things, um, kind of starting in my teenage years and those years where I didn't really know what to do. I did turn a little bit to painting and writing poems and things, and that's always kind of stuck with me. Um, and then kind of, I just like some of the other basic things that I think a lot of people like. So going for walks, I like to do photography. Um, I like to have a good meal. So really there's lots of those things that put them all together and they can really help. Why do I share my story um, with the partnership program? It really all goes back to what I talked about before with that 14 year old girl who didn't know what to do. Um, I, I think back to that time and if I would have had somebody come into our school and do a presentation like that and maybe you know gave us a pamphlet or told us this is who you can talk to and this is where you can go, I think the chances were, would have been very high that I would have done that. Um, but that just never happened. We were at a rural school and I think we probably had a half a day of an after, you know, a 30 minutes lesson on mental illness in a health class at some point, but that was really it. We didn't ever have conversations about who would you go to talk to. 
So that's really the, the force behind of why do I want to do this. Um, I enjoy speaking to all the age groups, but because of that feeling of, of that 14-year-old, I really enjoy speaking to the, the high school students just because I hope that I can be that person that I didn't have. Would people benefit from joining? I definitely think so. Um, I don't plan on going anywhere. I've been doing it for a couple of years and I've really enjoyed it. And so I would suspect it would be the same for others. Um, and I think there's lots of various possible benefits to it, right? So one is that feeling of giving back to the community of hopefully changing minds, reducing stigma, encouraging people to get treatment. So I think there's a really good feeling behind doing that. Second is sometimes people can't work or you know they're working part time and they need they would like to have something that they're doing in the community. Well, this is that opportunity as well to go out and be part of the community. Um, you can make lots of nice friends of people um, with similar disorder to you or you know the various mental illnesses and then too there's the um, professionals so it's always nice to know a few extra professionals on a kind of a friendly level and you get to have chats and stuff so I think there's a lot of great benefits to being part of the program. My name is Chelsea Daniels and I present the perspective um, I have bipolar 1 disorder. The symptoms of bipolar started um, when I was about 25 and I um, met my first psychiatrist and she diagnosed me with bipolar 2 and then I went off my medication for the first time a few months after being on medication and then I was diagnosed with bipolar 1. On a high, um, I start to have interesting ideas, thoughts, usually religious related and um, I start to just feel really elated kind of invincible um, it's a it's a high it's a, like a drug high you uh, you know it feels great but you do really uh, you do things that mess up your life on a low uh, a very much a low would be uh, depressed in bed for um, most of every day uh, very hard to get out of bed. Sometimes it's difficult to turn over in bed. Um, it's difficult to brush my teeth. Very hopeless. No motivation whatsoever. I was diagnosed with depression at 12 and then um, I got, I was introduced to alcohol at 13 and um, yeah, the depression got worse when I started drinking. The more heavier I drank, the more the depression worsened. Um, drugs got introduced, uh, so did suicidal thoughts, seemed to come along with the drug use. And um, prolonged drug use, um, after prolonged drug use was when I was diagnosed with bipolar, so I do believe that the drug use had something to do with that diagnosis. Uh, my mental health just keep get, getting worse and worse. The, uh, diagnosis got more, you know, ADHD got in, into there, anxiety, yeah, depression, and bipolar. And, um, and then when the drug use and alcohol stopped, oh yeah, the, the marijuana was introduced too, and that, uh, that uh, made me more depressed as well, you know, just really isolated and, uh, uh, just didn't want to do anything, didn't want to move, which contributed to the depression. And then after I was done using, after I stopped using, um, the depression of, after a couple years of recovery, the depression lessened. Um, 
you know, I'm so used to being depressed all my life that uh, it's weird now because I don't have depression. It's kind of strange. I haven't, I haven't had any depression, depressive episodes at all for uh, since December, so almost a year. And um, my medication load is a lot less. I'm no longer on antidepressants either. Um, knock on wood, it won't come back. I mean, who knows? It could come back at any time. It could come back tomorrow. But uh, it's gone for now. And um, yeah, since I've been in recovery, my medication load has gotten down and um, things don't bother me as much as they used to. Um, I feel joy, I can laugh. It's a lot better. Stigma hasn't affected me much. I surrounded myself with, I've always have been surrounded. I've always been lucky to be surrounded by very understanding people. Um, who always encouraged my recovery, um, friends, family, healthcare workers, people in um, AA, people in the mental health uh, community, um, just people who want to see me do well and they get that I got a problem. I'd believe I'd be dead in a ditch if I didn't have medication. In the past, if I went off my medication, um, had strange ideas and did reckless behavior. Um, police were involved before. I always ended up in the psych ward against my um, will. Life got very messy and it was a big mess to clean up after. Sobriety from drugs and alcohol has helped me in every area of life. How I feel, how I act, everything about me has been changing since I've sobered up for the better. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me uh, many supports. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a safe, a place to fa feel safe. And um, it has given me confidence to talk to people, safe people to, you know, practice boundaries with. And um, it has really built up my self-esteem. I've always had lots of support, um, so I don't know what it's like without support, but I'm sure it makes it a lot easier to recover having support and like AA just gives me lots of support and the more support I have the stronger I feel. Things that have helped me in my recovery, um, well I have some animals, some neighbors dogs that I take for walks, that helps me. Um, support of people and art therapy, um, I like to bead earrings, I like to quilt. Uh, exercise is very important to me and having um, regular sleep is very important for my mental health and just really caring friends. The reason I share my story in the partnership program is because I hope that one, that if, even if it's just one person here's my story and they can relate to it and they seek help, then um, that's all I want. Joining the partnership program has benefited me. It's made me more comfortable with sharing my story and it's uh, given me more support, uh, more support of people who um, share similar uh, struggles. Um, it's made me more comfortable with being me and feel less uh, shameful about my illness. I'm a stigma buster because um, people with mental illness can be just as awesome as people without mental illness. They are. So 
And I want people, other people to see that. My name is Nicole Kennedy and I'm presenting for the people with schizophrenia and I've been presenting for about a year now. Growing up I had depression and insomnia and pretty bad anxiety. That would be in like my teen years and then as I got older my symptoms became more um, psychosis. Um, I used to believe that I could hear other people's thoughts and that I was getting messages from God and sort of disorganized thinking. I did have hallucinations and delusions. My delusions were mainly spiritual and believing that I was connecting with God and that I was receiving messages. And then my hallucinations, I would feel and smell um, what I thought were spirits. So I would hear, smell like sense of sage and sweet grass and I used to think that the spirits were blessing me um, and then I had tactile hallucinations of them touching me or like poking me on the shoulder, stuff like that. It's been so long now that I haven't been ha hearing voices. So actually, I did hear some negative voices, but I thought that I was hearing other people's thoughts. And so I would hear other people's thoughts, which could be like kind things that they were saying or um, mean stuff. But now I've kind of boiled it down to that was like what I thought they were, what they might be thinking, but it showed up as a voice. Stress and lack of sleep kind of go hand in hand for me. It can cause flare-ups as well. I face challenges getting help by having to wait months to get seen by a psychiatrist. And that was really difficult because I had to keep going back to the ER to see a psychiatrist when I needed urgent help um, and the system isn't really set up for that. My life changed for the better once I got help because I stopped having delusions and hallucinations. I don't hear voices anymore. Um, I'm able to live a pretty good life. I can go to work. I work full-time now. Medication helped me a lot. It's really important for me to stay on my meds because um, they prevent me from having symptoms that are debilitating, for one, and if I don't take my meds, I have never tried it, but I've heard that it ends up really badly for people. Seeing a therapist has not really helped me because I find it's really difficult for when you have psychosis to kind of get help in that way at least for me personally. I haven't really got much benefit from that. But whenever something comes up that's really stressful, then the therapist will help. Um, my family and friends supporting me has been phenomenal, like unbelievable, honestly, because I thought that I would get stigmatized for having schizophrenia, but my friends and family all accepted me and they saw me for who I am and they saw me beyond having schizophrenia, so. Stigma has affected me at my work for some, some situations when they know that I have it, but for the most part, stigma is mostly just something that I'm scared of, and it's not something that I face directly, but it can be the elephant in the room a lot of times when even in like medical situations, when they ask what medications I'm taking, it can be um, it can be challenging, and it can be awkward. Um, the things that have been helpful for me have been music, especially when I was in the deeper states of psychosis, and the medication has hasn't kicked in yet. Music therapy helped me a lot um, to keep me relaxed, and then. Art therapy helps a lot too because I feel like I express my emotion through art. And then pet therapy because I have a cat and he's really awesome. I share my story with the partnership program because I want other people to know what schizophrenia is like and that I'm just another person and that it's not a big scary thing.
people with schizophrenia are just like any other person and they're not scary or violent. That's not a symptom of schizophrenia. And I would like people to know that I'm still me if for some reason you're watching this and you know me. I would like to see people with schizophrenia and mental illness treated with respect and dignity. I would like to see across Canada more access for mental illness um, and also for the general public to know signs and symptoms. I think that would be really helpful because it would have been really obvious that I had schizophrenia if people knew what to look for. I think that joining the partnership program is good for anyone that has a mental illness because A, you get to share your story and B, you get to break stigma. I like the team approach because it shows different aspects of mental illness and different perspectives and you get to learn that having a mental illness is individual. It's not the same for everyone, even if you have the same illness. I have a professional role uh, as opposed to lived experiences as other members of the partnership team do. And uh, my lived experience has been seeing a lot of people living the experience of various mental health issues. My role being a professional, I've been asked to do quite a bit of work with uh, training programs in the university or at uh, SIAS because uh, I feel it important that people going into professional careers such as medicine, uh, nursing, social work, and psychology, for example, or can be our leading advocates when they go into practice if they understand some of the stigma that faces people with, uh, uh, with mental health issues and addiction problems. I try to educate them to various uh, brain disorders, which they're getting in their clinical or in their educational program, but to try to reinforce the importance of hope and uh, early uh, treatment and diagnosis. Schizophrenia is not a very common condition compared to a lot of the others, but it's one of the most disabling or can be one of the most disabling because it's basically a connectivity disorder in the brain where circuits and chemicals are disturbed uh, from various reasons, sometimes heredity, sometimes change in genetics, or even uh, womb issues. When they're, uh, when they're uh, in the womb, uh, the mom may have uh, uh, infections which lead to inflammation and is thought to change some of the neurodevelopmental pathways. And uh, the circuits that are really affected are those that deal with perception, thoughts, and beliefs, what we call cognitive symptoms, uh, but also uh, those that may lead to uh, negative behaviors, which are a challenge for individuals. And this system is one that deals with positive motivation and such. When the individuals uh, uh, suffer from the, uh, the effects of the uh, impact on the uh, perceptual system, they often develop uh, uh, hallucinations or misperceptions and often voices. Uh, they will have changes in their belief system because of changes within their uh, brain organization and often thought disorder. We call these positive symptoms and uh, the problem with them is that they form a relationship we call psychosis where a person loses contact with reality and will pay more attention to their inner world than their external world and the internal world rather takes over. Not that they can't deal with the external world but their patterns of behavior are often led to by internal processes, these hallucinations and delusions and thought disorder. The other problems that occur are called negative or cognitive symptoms where it seems to impact a different uh, 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 circuit in the brain, which is most important for motivation and taking activity as a social person. And so the individual, when this is disrupted, leads to isolation, withdrawal, 
uh, sometimes extremely low motivation and, and loss of self-care at times. And these are more difficult to treat. It's a challenging issue because it occurs very early in the person's life in teen and young adult years. And so therefore, without uh, early intervention and treatment, it can become a long-term disabling feature. Most often, people with schizophrenia are taken advantage of as opposed to them harming or taking advantage of others. Although, unfortunately, in the media and in motion pictures over the years, there have been things that have occurred that lead people to think that uh, all people with schizophrenia may be violent. And it's rather a rare situation. Although, unfortunately, some people have uh, had uh, outbursts of rage that lead to the media following these, and they seem uh, very extraordinary that people could do this to often their parents or loved ones or people they don't even know. But this occurs in a very small percentage of individuals with schizophrenia. It's a, a disconnectivity disorder, therefore, uh, the system in the brain, the circuits and the chemicals related to that are misfiring and not acting uh, in the usual fashion. But uh, it's not related to a personality development or a split, split personality. And that's been a, something that's been around. I don't think people talk about it much anymore, and they shouldn't. Bipolar disorder varies between 3 and 4 percent presently. Uh, it's a, a mood disorder which also impacts the reward system in the brain and also the rhythms, the circadian rhythms that are part of our biological and psychological life. So bipolar uh, in affecting these parts of the brain uh, has a characteristic of either having long periods of mania or depression or sometimes short periods of mania and long-term depression or rapid cycling. But I'm going to focus mostly on the individuals that are called bipolar one, which are people that have uh, extremes in, uh, in mania on the one hand, and mania includes the excesses of look, seeking out rewards, impulsivity, having ideas about self-aggrandizement, and all of the factors that lead to uh, reward system changes. Uh, in addition, the circadian rhythms are thrown off in a way so they're often not sleeping, uh, don't care as much about eating or active, always on the go, planning new ideas which often fail. And so their mood is very high. Uh, the other uh, side of the mood chain is exactly the opposite, and that is the depressed side, and often goes on for longer than the manic side, but it can be quite uh, devastating to the person. And they often get more depression than even the unipolar depressive people, and often will develop a psychosis with it, where they're totally worthless, much the, set, the opposite of those who are high and grandiose, believing uh, nothing, they're invincible, nothing can harm them and such. And so in the one side, uh, the person's high, the other side low. But because of this uh, maladjustment in their brain, they're often very prone to suicide. And because their depressions may remind them that they're missing the highs that they could have. And they're highs that are occurring internally, not caused by any substance other than the brain chemicals and such. So it's a very challenging disorder and needs early intervention and treatment. I'll just mention briefly the bipolar 2, which is a new term, at least in the last 10 or 15 years, where individuals have short periods of hypo or low mania or mania, but lasting shortly, but quite large uh, or long times of, uh, of depression. Clinical depression is a condition. It's not in the nomenclature. We call it either major depressive illness or unipolar depression, basically because the symptoms of depression are the same as the one I mentioned with uh, bipolar depression, but uh, uh, sometimes it may be more moderate or mild and less severe, although people with 
the clinical or unipolar depression can also get quite severe depressions. Uh, it's different on, on the side of its, uh, its uh, uh, prevalence. Uh, one would say in most situations up to 15 or maybe more percent of people may suffer with the clinical depression in their lifetime. And uh, it starts often later in life than the bipolar depression, and, uh, uh, but is not associated with mood swings in any way as bipolar depression is, uh, and not really associated with psychosis as the severe mania or depression people have. And uh, individuals, although can be sometimes treated very well, it often leads to about a third of people who are suffering from chronic unipolar depression over the years and could be quite a, a, a long-term situation. And of course, similarly to uh, bipolar depression, there's a high risk for self-harm and, and successful suicide as well. Uh, one difference also is there are genetic factors, but probably more factors related to, uh, to loss, uh, sadness, uh, and stress than, than uh, the bipolar depression, which is much more biochemical. Not to say that unipolar depression isn't, but it's, it's much more related to situational and person, personal issues such as negative thoughts and anxieties often. Anxiety disorders are probably the most common, and it's called a disorder because anxiety is very prevalent in, in all of us. We, any stressor can lead to anxiety occurring for us. But it's called a disorder because the, uh, the system involved is responding to threats, and it's like fear. Fear is a response, the flight or fight response uh, when a, an animal or a human is threatened. But anxiety is much more related to internal threats, and therefore the threats internal related to anxiety can either be due to uh, thinking problems, which uh, occur in individuals with uh, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, where they are very worried, and their thoughts often are rather catastrophic about something happening to people themselves, their health, or others. And the, the more chemical type of uh, condition is called panic disorder. It's another one of the anxiety disorders, which occurs in about 10% of people. Uh, and it really is as much a reaction, an overreaction of the uh, threat system, which is a, the, called the uh, autonomic nervous system, which affects all of our body and leads to symptoms like uh, not getting your breath, not feeling that your heart's going fast or palpitations, a lot of sweating and other symptoms like this which make people think they're having a heart attack or may die or in fact may go crazy. So panic disorder is much more of a chemical uh, anxiety whereas generalized anxiety, social anxiety disorder where individuals are, are often shy in ordinary life but do develop severe symptoms where they really try to avoid other people and, and become very anxious and sometimes panicky in social situations. The brain is a unit and therefore when something happens in one circuit, it has invariably some impact on other circuits. When we see symptoms like depression and anxiety and disorders related to those two conditions, we, uh, we, we realize when we see so many people with anxiety disorders then suffering from depression, uh, about 40%. And those people, particularly with unipolar uh, depressions, uh, suffering from anxiety disorders, about 40%. So there's a huge overlap. And so even though we artificially separate these conditions, the brain doesn't artificially separate them because they're often all interconnected. The other connection that's important that I found, and even a diagnosis exists, is called schizoaffective disorder, which is a melding of symptoms of bipolar uh, one disorder with uh, mania and, and, uh, and depression, even to psychotic degrees, but also disconnected 
disconnection symptoms like schizophrenia, where the person may have delusions, voices, hallucinations, and thought disorder uh, along with it. Uh, one of the large comorbidities or having uh, associations are substance use disorders with all four of the major mental illnesses we've talked about. It's very high with schizophrenia, uh, bipolar in particular, where people often get very much involved with substances, trying to uh, get their high without having a manic attack from their own illness. And then, of course, anxiety and depression lead to that as well, because uh, when you have these for over time, people begin to turn to other ways of helping themselves rather than getting medical treatment, either through psychotherapy or medications. They will self-medicate to deal with their problems, and all of a sudden they've got uh, an addiction or severe problems with abuse of many substances. The first step, I think, in looking toward or talking about treatment should be the first step. And that is, once assessment is made and a diagnosis is made, the education of the person and their family and close loved ones. And you also want to mention something about it as being a brain disorder. Uh, and even though that can be scary, you then follow up with talking about the hopeful side is that we've learned a lot about brain disorders and that they are treated by medications, technological devices, and therapies. The best approach to people with most mental illnesses is to start with the family physician who's well-trained or should be trained enough to see the majority or a lot of people with anxiety and depressions and even early symptoms of bipolar or schizophrenia and such. What I espouse or think is important is a coordinated, integrated system where people move from the family physician to a counselor, uh, a psychotherapist, uh, then if more need to a psychologist, a professional psycho doctoral level psychologist, and then saving the psychiatrists to do the most complicated uh, help that people need. I've always had a realization that teamwork is very important and there's really an allegiance between primary care, uh, family physicians, and psychiatry and mental health. And if those four systems can start working better together, I think we'll be able to deal with the many people we're getting to be less stigmatized that we're telling uh, you have this and it's not to be stigmatized and it's the same as anyone else. We're working on the one end to get more people coming, but we've got to get more people on the other end doing the treatment, otherwise people have conditions that are not being treated. People living with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety and depression are all welcome to join our program and share their story of recovery. Family members of people with mental illness are welcome to join our program and share how their family member is affected by mental health. And also healthcare professionals or advocates are welcome to join our team to present the facts on mental illness. It's really important to be a stigma buster and promote treatment and recovery from mental illness because we lose so many people to suicide and people lose quality of life if they're not treated. That's why these presentations are important. They, put, they give people dignity, put a human face to this, these different disorders and um, hopefully society will treat people with more compassion once they see a presentation. And hopefully people will reach out and get help um, once they see a presentation and we've seen some positive results from that. We've received a lot of positive feedback. The high schools and colleges and universities have us back on a regular basis. So we regularly ha go there every year. Right now we're offering presentations online by Zoom and WebEx in other formats. Presenters living with mental health disorders are given an honorarium every time they present with our program. They are provided with assistance in developing their script and um, our family members are also provided with assistance and our healthcare 
professionals and advocates are provided with assistance. So anyone interested in joining our program will be given the help they need in developing their presentation and um, we provide people with regular feedback so we, we keep our stories current and up to date and with the latest facts um, because sometimes things are changing with mental health so we really want to keep things up to date. Roughly in Saskatchewan we've spoken to nearly 200,000 people and that's over 4,000 presentations since 1998 so that's a lot of people and usually those audiences are 20 to 30 people audiences so that's a lot of you know a lot of people over a long course of time and we'll speak to groups as small as three people we'll speak to groups as large as 300. I just want to make people aware of some of the stigma that surrounds mental illness that's really what we're here for today and people with schizophrenia are not schizophrenics they're not their illness they're people living with schizophrenia People with bipolar have bipolar disorder, they're not bipolar, you know. People are not crazy, they're not mental, they're not lunatics, they're people with a brain disorder. And just how people will need medication for diabetes or any other illness, they'll need medication for these um, mental health illnesses, especially schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and oftentimes anxiety and depression as well. I really want to make young people aware that there are many triggers surrounding um, affecting people with mental illness that can bring it on sooner or make it worse and um, making people aware that marijuana is a major trigger right now for people especially with psychosis schizophrenia and bipolar and that um, if they avoid that their chances of developing a chronic mental illness go down and their chances of recovery if they already have a mental illness go up if they stop drinking alcohol and they stop using pot there are many good resources in the community that people can access. The Schizophrenia Society offers support groups for families of people with mental illness called Strengthening Families. And um, there are many other groups throughout Sask Saskatchewan and in Saskatoon that offer support for people with mental illness. And Mental Health and Addiction Services, the Canadian Mental Health Association, um, Crocus Co-op, the Saskatoon Housing Coalition, and um, community-based groups such as Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous are often a wonderful program for people to join, um, especially if you have a loved one affected by alcoholism. And we see a lot of people with schizophrenia, with bipolar, and with depression that are affected by alcoholism. And if you're not directly affected, you may have a family member. So Al-Anon is a great support for the families and Alcoholics Anonymous or AA is a great support for the person directly affected by alcoholism. I'd like to offer some tips for people, you know, struggling. I know COVID's a really difficult time. Mental health is always a big topic and addictions, but we're seeing addictions on the rise during COVID and anxiety and depression in particular are going up. So people can do things like talk to their family doctor, see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, they can get on medication. There's other natural things you can do for your mental health, such as walking, exercise is great. Laughter creates endorphins, it's really good for your mental health. Um, you know, having contact with people, belonging to a group, talking on the phone to someone every day, you know, being involved with art therapy, music therapy, having a pet, an animal can be very comforting to people in their mental health. So it's not just medication, but medication is a cornerstone to treating mental illnesses. But there are so many other things um, that help people's mental health over time.